Welcome. Our look at the Atlantic slave trade showed that in the modern era, West Africa's history became inextricably bound up with that of the wider world and especially with Europe. This is true of the extreme southern end of Africa as well. But the story played out very differently here. In another lecture earlier on the Swahili world, we noted that by the 16th century, the wealth of the Indian Ocean networks had begun to attract the attention of, of new players from Europe, the first being the Portuguese. Other European mercantile powers followed, including the Dutch, who particularly concern us here. By the mid-17th century, Amsterdam was arguably the, the richest city on earth. A book by a Harvard historian is entitled The Embarrassment of Riches, and it's a, a portrait of, of Amsterdam uh, at, that, at that time. Uh, the Dutch East India Company was the world's most successful trading firm uh, in that era. Now, as the company's name suggests, its principal object, its principal interest, its principal target area, in a sense, was, was Asia. It was, it was interested, above all, in the legendary wares, the, the, the silks and spices that we've all heard about for so long, uh, of the East, of, of Asia. The Dutch East India Company then was a, a classic example of the mercantile capitalist era. The idea was to go somewhere, obtain the goods, and distribute them, take them somewhere else, usually back home to Europe, uh, in the calculation, in the hope of generating profit. Now, the company held a charter from the Dutch crown, giving it the right to operate, in many respects, as a state unto itself. And we will meet chartered companies later in this course. They're, they're actually a, a rather common sort of halfway house between private and public enterprise, which has been uh, important in the history of many colonial uh, parts of the world. Already, uh, the Dutch East India Company had pioneered the establishment of a Dutch colony in what ultimately came to be called Indonesia. Uh, and in fact, that area stayed a Dutch colony until the late 1940s. Now, in order to go to and from East Asia, from, from Europe. The company's ships had constantly to circumnavigate uh, Africa. Again, there's no Suez Canal until uh, 1867. So uh, the circumnavigation pioneered by the Portuguese was the essential uh, step in, in this mercantile activity. It's a long voyage. It, it takes many months. And it was necessary for these ships uh, at various points to, to stop, and they did stop at, uh, at, at various points along the, the African littoral, the African coast, as part of that, that circumnavigation. And beginning at some point, probably in the, in the 1500s even, the company's ships had begun, with some regularity, to stop at Table Bay. Again, that shouldn't surprise us. Our portrait of Table Bay in Cape Town was, in a sense, based around the notion of its being a, a protected deep water harbor there uh, along a very uh, dangerous and rugged coast line. They would obtain these supplies of, of fresh water and food and, and, and move on, often doing the same thing uh, on, the, on the return trip. In 1652, the company decided, its board of directors, the, the Heron 17, based in Am Amsterdam, decided to establish a permanent post at Table Bay. And originally, this move had quite limited objectives. Uh, it was to streamline, essentially, or the objectives were to streamline the reprovisioning of the company's ships with fresh supplies of, uh, certainly of, of meat dried or salted, and uh, hopefully of uh, vegetables as well, and of course all important uh, fresh water, which was uh, available at many points in the, in the region. Let us pause at, at this moment then, 
1652 is, is a long way from being the beginning of South African history, but it's certainly a critical turning point in South African history. Let's remind ourselves, uh, refresh a little bit on the human geography of what is now South Africa uh, at, at, this, at this point in time. We know that the original Khoisan hunter-gatherer population had been settled thinly, uh, distributed, but settled over the entire region for some thousands uh, of, of years. We know that uh, that population was displaced, replaced, um, or absorbed by Bantu Iron Age mixed farmers, but only in the eastern half of what is today South Africa, east of that 20-inch rainfall line. I, I mentioned a few lectures back, 20 inches being essentially the, the minimum for, uh, for cultivation. On the east side of that line, we find uh, Bantu mixed farmers, uh, but not on the west side of it. In that western half of the, the modern country, Khoisan peoples, therefore, still predominated. But by this time, quite a number of Khoisan communities had adopted pastoralism and kept extensive uh, herds of uh, flocks and herds of sheep and, and cattle. And at this point, I'm going to do a little linguistic work here, uh, as it were. I'm going to break down that, that term Khoisan uh, to get at this adoption by some of these uh, persons in the western half of, of the modern republic uh, of pastoralism, okay? Um, Khoi San. Let's take the first half of the word Khoi, often doubled into Khoi Khoi. This is the term that we will use to refer to pastoralists of the western part of, of South Africa, including the area in the immediate vicinity of Table Bay. That region, today we think of it as Mediterranean, but crops like wheat and wine were obviously were not being grown yet. And the pastoralists found considerable uh, good uh, pasturage in the vicinity, the hinterland of, of Table Bay. The Dutch eventually called them Hottentots, and you may have seen that term, and you will see that term in old historical documents uh, and so forth. It's a, 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 of obscure origin, and I'm not going to, uh, to take the time to explain that right now. Now, those who remain dependent on hunting and gathering at this point then, let's reserve, as it were, the last part of the word, the second half of the word, and, and refer to them at this point and forward then as San. And these would have been the people that, uh, that, we, that the uh, Dutch uh, dubbed the Bosman or, or so-called Bushmen. Okay, now gradually the company's original intent, uh, limited intention of creating an outpost on the edge of the sea and obviously on the edge of the land gave way to something very different. Again, this is a classic case of sort of uh, unintended consequences or uh, the unfolding of the story rather different than, differently than it was originally uh, envisioned. It became something quite different from an outpost. It became a beachhead from which eventually the European conquest of modern-day uh, modern South Africa would proceed. Now, at first, before this change gathered momentum, Khoi Khoi communities, and these are these pastoralist communities in the vicinity of Cape Town, were reasonably happy to trade some of their livestock to the Dutch uh, for the provisioning of these ships and the maintenance of the company's settlement. In return, they, they often received uh, copperware and ironware. Uh, in fact, they received some of the uh, goods. This is probably from the east. This is probably when tea drinking, which is now ubiquitous in in South Africa was, was, was introduced. Again, at first and for a time, this was a, a relationship between the local Khoi Khoi pastoralists and the Dutch post uh, under the Dutch East India Company uh, of mutual benefit. And the transactions were entered into more or less voluntarily. Over time, the balance there uh, begins to shift towards uh, coercion, but it did take some time. In 1657, the company released nine of its employees and granted them small farms not far from, from Table Bay. It's, if you go around the side of, of Table Mountain to uh, 
a river valley called the Liesbeck River Valley. This is where uh, those nine uh, eventually uh, settled. This was a classic case, among other things, of different cultural traditions uh, leading, in this case, to, to conflict. When those first nine settlers went around and attempted to establish their farms, they didn't see any of the markers that were familiar to them from, from Europe uh, designating this area as, as the property of anyone. They didn't see the fences or, or the beacons or, or the permanent structures, uh, etc. To them, quite understandably, it looked, it looked empty. Now, as you can imagine, one at least of the several, and I want to emphasize that, there was not a single Khoi Khoi pastoralist group in the vicinity of Cape Town, or probably a dozen uh, of anywhere from a few hundred to a couple of thousand uh, each. At least one of those saw that, that pasturage very differently, that, that land that these settlers came to. They considered it part of a seasonal pasturage cycle uh, to which they intended to return. This was an absolutely crucial precedent because it represents the start of permanent European, permanent white settlement at the southern tip of, of Africa. Obviously, South African history would have been very different if that had never occurred at all. The world that, that Mandela grew up in would have been a vastly different world had there not occurred at some point the beginnings of permanent, people who intended to stay and who intended to see their succeeding descendants, children and children's children, stay there uh, as well. More settlers followed, although the numbers, it is fair to say, were, were small compared to uh, immigration to a place like, like America, for instance. Most of the land taken up by white settlers, uh, therefore, was seen by the Khoi Khoi as, as their own. The pressure on the Khoi Khoi's livestock also redoubled, both because there was an increasing number of ships calling into Table Bay, not only the company's own ships, but once the post was established, they realized they could pay for this station partly by provisioning ships from other nations who, who called in there as well. Well, of course, all of that means increased demand for livestock to be slaughtered to provide the meat provisions for all of these ships, and again, the, the demand, therefore, for Khoi Khoi the principal item of Khoi Khoi livelihood uh, accelerated. It's also true that, of course, as more settlers came in and established themselves on the land, they needed livestock to, to stock those farms. And, of course, originally those are, are likely to come from the Khoi Khoi uh, as well. So we begin to see what we could call a sort of squeeze uh, being exerted against this, this old Khoi Khoi uh, world, which uh, eventually will be, will be decisive. Now, the Khoi Khoi were not necessarily uh, at all passive in this case. There were at least three substantial wars fought before uh, the 17th century had come to an end. Um, the first of these was, uh, was actually in 1650-59. And for a time, it appeared the Khoi Khoi would prevail. They had basically uh, all the, the settlers as well as the company personnel pinned up inside of the, the fort uh, on Table Bay, but they were unable to deliver the decisive blow. And in the succeeding weeks and months, uh, the pendulum turned, and eventually uh, they had to uh, negotiate uh, uh, terms. In the aftermath of that, um, we, we have a, a remarkable first-person account, which uh, I want to read uh, a little bit from. It comes from the diary, the journals of Jan van Riebeck, who was for 10 years, from 1652 to 1662, the commander of the companies. When I say the company, I, I'm going to be referring to the, the Dutch East India Company. Commander of the company's fort at, at Cape Town. Van Riebeck then established that fort, and he kept quite meticulous, as I say, journals and diaries, and they're, they're really a very rich uh, source uh, in, indeed. The passage I want to read to you uh, essentially is the minutes of a, of, a, of a meeting between Van Riebeck and his aides and some of what the Dutch call captains, that is the, the leaders of these uh, 
Khoi uh, Khoi communities in the, the vicinity of, of what is becoming Cape Town uh, at that point. So he starts this passage with uh, what strikes me as a rather fair, perhaps remarkably fair, um, uh, recording of the points made by the, uh, the, the Khoi Khoi themselves. And let me give it to you. They spoke for a long time about our taking every day for our own use more of the land which had belonged to them from all ages and on which they were accustomed to pasture their cattle. They also asked whether, if they were to come to Holland, they would be permitted to act in a similar manner, saying, it would not matter if you stayed at the fort, but you come into the interior, selecting the best land for yourselves and never once asking whether we like it or whether it will put us to any inconvenience. They therefore insisted very strenuously that they should again be allowed free access to the pasture. They objected that there was not enough grass for both their cattle and ours. Are we not right, therefore, to prevent you from getting any more cattle? For if you get many cattle, you come and occupy our pasture with them, and then say the land's not wide enough for us both. Who then, with the greatest degree of justice, should give way? The natural owner or the foreign invader? Again, this is from von Riebeck's journal. It's remarkably candid and it ends remarkably uh, bluntly. Von Riebeck's words. They insisted so much on this point that we told them that they had now lost that land in war and therefore could not expect to get it back. It was our intention to keep it. Now, as if uh, the, the squeeze on Khoi Khoi livelihood in the form of land and, and livestock was not enough, we have uh, another example here of the intervention of, of disease in, in human history. In this case, the most dramatic element was, or the most dramatic moment was the smallpox epidemic of, of 1713. Now, you know, in a lecture, uh, a couple of times ago, I said that uh, Africans from West Africa had developed over thousands of years, uh, uh, you know, a relative degree of resistance to old world diseases because of coming and going between the Mediterranean, European world, and, and West Africa. But of course, how far away from Europe can you get and still be on the African continent? We're at that place. If there was any population in all of Africa that would not have had exposure to these old world diseases or to European uh, uh, microbes, we might expect to find it at the very southern tip of Africa. And in fact, the um, introduction of, of smallpox, it apparently came ashore from one of the company's ships, the, the Stavanisa was the name of the ship, um, with the company's, uh, that was, sorry, with the, the, the crew's uh, laundry. There had been an outbreak of, of smallpox on the ship. The people had recovered, which was remarkable enough, and the captain was uh, wise enough not to allow them nonetheless to go ashore, but sent ashore the, the laundry, and that apparently had enough of the bacillus to create a devastating impact. It affected all the population groups in Cape Town, but it ravaged the, the Khoi Khoi population, again, perhaps because of no previous uh, exposure. By the later 1700s, the Khoi Khoi, or indeed the San, the, the so-called Bushmen who remained independent, were those who were still outside the Cape Colony's reach, or in some cases had moved outside uh, the Cape Colony's reach. Those inside the colony were largely reduced to a servile working class. They were not, however, legally enslaved. So we get the incorporation, essentially, of the remnants of the old Khoi Khoi San, the old Khoi San world, uh, as part of a working class in a new kind of society, a colonial society on the make in uh, the, the case of the Cape Colony at the southwestern tip of Africa. The first, in a sense, frontier fate here then uh, that we'll be pursuing later uh, ends with the absorption of the survivors of these processes as part of the, the serv servile class in the Cape. Now, meanwhile, as early as 1658, the company was uh, trying to meet uh, another need. 
uh, and that was a growing need for, uh, for labor. And as we, as we noted in our lectures on the Atlantic slave trade, uh, it certainly is not surprising that Europeans of, of this era would have turned to the option of, of chattel slavery uh, to meet it. Most of these slaves, however, were not African at all. They came from various points around the, the Indian Ocean Rim, Madagascar, southern India, Malaysia, Indonesia. Many of them were Muslims. And in fact, this is the rather um, indirect route by which Islam establishes a presence in southern Africa uh, quite different and quite separate from its, its presence established in West uh, or Eastern Africa. Now, you know, again, this makes for some interesting uh, comparative thinking uh, to me. You know, the last couple of lectures we were talking about West Africa, West Central Africa, where millions of persons were essentially exported against their will, left Africa, and of course brought to the New World. South Africa, on the other hand, represents a case where, one of the few cases on the African continent at this point, where enslaved persons are going to be imported. Now, in that respect, the history of, of what became South Africa, the history of the Cape Colony here, in some respects, South African history, therefore, bears more resemblance, it seems to me, to the history of a place like the United States. In other words, an importer of labor. But again, the irony here in this modern expectation that if the subject slavery in the modern world, oh, it must have been black Africans who were enslaved. Not so. In this case, we have in the bulk, in, in the great majority, non, people of non-African origin brought into a part of the African continent as chattel slaves. So we have a sort of bifurcated, a kind of divided uh, working class which is uh, emerging uh, in the old Cape Colony. You might see the Cape Colony society as a sort of uh, three-layered uh, pyramid with the company and its officials at the top. They, after all, constitute the government of the place. The independent Dutch descended, a few um, French Huguenots eventually, and a few Germans, uh, uh, but predominantly Dutch uh, settlers uh, in the middle, and then this divided uh, laboring class at the bottom. In incorporated Khoi Khoi predominantly, uh, not legally enslaved, and these imported slaves brought in from the Indian Ocean Rim. Now, the Cape Colony provides a perfect example of one of my, my pet themes, uh, and that is how ethnic identity, ethnicity, is, is fluid, that it is, it, is, it is changeable. It's a product of history. Uh, two ethnic groups were, in essence, born in the old Cape Colony, and it's virtually impossible to talk about modern South Africa without mentioning them. So let us look at the origins of Afrikaners and so-called uh, colored. The Dutch settlers at the Cape were, were known as, as just that, as the Cape Dutch. Uh, in, in translation, it, it rendered as the Cape Dutch. And um, eventually, however, as they, as they literally became landed in southern Africa, they came to be known as, as Boers. Uh, that is simply the, the Dutch word for, for farmer, basically. Again, as is so often the case, language er, gives us a lot of clues as to uh, the unfolding of history. We saw that in the case of Kiswahili uh, and, and so forth in East Africa. In this case, the, the, the label for a community, an identity, literally reflects their permanence at the southern tip of Africa. Their landed nests, their roots, if you like, now transplanted from Europe and established in southern Africa, Boers. The Dutch-based language they spoke uh, eventually, of course, came to be known as Afrikaans. And Afrikaans, which we'll be encountering many words in Afrikaans uh, the rest of the way home, uh, Afrikaans is considered by linguists to be a, a separate language from um, from, from Dutch, uh, but obviously they are, 
are certainly um, related. Now, eventually, the Cape Dutch, who came to be known as the Boers, emerge, especially in the 20th century, as the so-called Afrikaners. And when we use the term Afrikaner in uh, South African parlance today, this is who we're talking about. We're talking about the white settler population there uh, of predominantly Dutch origin. Now, it may be ironic that Afrikaner basically means Africans. In other words, they have taken the label, the name, from the place that they have come to. In a way, it's a process, again, parallel with American history, where people who considered themselves to be colonial English, uh, for instance, in the, in the 1600s or early 1700s in a place like Virginia, obviously, at a certain point, begin to consider themselves Virginians, or dare I say it, Americans. The way that colonial English become Americans, in a way, reflects the way that Cape Dutch, colonial Dutch, eventually become Afrikaners. They become, in their own mind, Africans. Ironic as that may seem to, to later observers. Now, eventually, the descendants, primarily drawn from the two sections of this working class, incorporated Khoi Khoi or Khoi San, and the imported slaves came to be, if you'll forgive the term, came to be lumped together, as it were, uh, as South Africa's so-called colored population. Now, um, it's important to clarify th this term, especially, I think, for a predominantly American audience here. Colored, as we all know, is uh, a an old term to refer to people in the United States of, of African descent, what today would be called African Americans or, or Black Americans. It's understandable, perhaps, therefore, that, that many people assume that colored in South Africa must be the same thing, in a sense, that it, it refers to the black African population. And that is uh, incorrect, uh, legally, for many years. And I have to say, uh, to substantial measure, socially, as well, these are, are quite distinct categories, black and colored in South Africa came to be very different legal categories under the old apartheid system. Uh, the colored, in essence, occupied a sort of middle rung, if you like, uh, between uh, the privileged uh, whites and least privileged blacks in that, in that population. Again, another way that not simply ethnicity but racial um, categorization uh, can be shaped and, and made differently by humans in different places. People make race, and they do it differently. Now, given the, the, the translation often given for colored is, quote, mixed race. If you look at news uh, items about, you know, South Africa's colored population, this or that, often in parentheses they'll say colored or mixed race. Well, there's certainly a, a kernel of truth to that, although, uh, again, I think it can be misleading. I think a lot of people in the U.S. might think, well, oh, I see, okay, that person had one black parent and one white parent. Probably not in the 21st century or, or 20th century. They probably had two so-called colored parents and probably four so-called colored grandparents, etc. Now, there was some, quote, racial mixing, uh, if, if that's what we want to call it, and maybe that shouldn't surprise us, since both the immigrant Dutch populations, for a time, and the imported slave populations were disproportionately male and sought partners in anything ranging from legalized, sanctified marriage at one extreme to rape at the other. It should not surprise us that that comes up in a, a racially ordered colonial society and everything in between. Now, the children of any of those unions tended also to fall into the so-called uh, colored category. But I emphasize again that most of this so-called mixing took place long ago in the old Cape Colony. And in fact, most of the persons today categorized as colored are probably more or less purely descended from the old Khoisan 
and imported slave populations. The Dutch eventually lost their colony at the Cape. Around the year 1800, this is related to intrigues surrounding uh, that guy called Napoleon in, in Europe and sort of the geopolitics of that, it, it need not concern us directly. But the Cape Colonial Experiment comes to an end in the dozen, 15 years or so around uh, the year 1800. And uh, we have yet another player, another part of South African history to, to examine. In 1820, the first British settlers arrived and South Africa's endless complexity uh, deepened. One aspect, eventually, of British rule was that when abolition of slavery in the British Empire came in the mid-1830s, it meant that the old legal distinction between enslaved persons in the Cape and indigenous persons who were not legally enslaved was meaningless. Yet another element which tended to blur and meld the line between initially separate populations and to see them in a sense emerge as this category known as colored. In our next lecture, we'll be leaving the Cape Colony and leaping far uh, to the east to look at equally dramatic developments in the, the southern Bantu world. Thank you.